Hey everyone, welcome back to another installment of Joe and Code here on YouTube. I'm Joe Garcia, DevOps Security Engineer for CyberArk. Today we're going to be expanding upon the last video that I did where I showed you how to install our central credential provider as well as configure and test it. We're gonna be taking that a step further and we're going to be integrating it with Ansible Tower from Red Hat and that automation platform that they provide. We're going to be utilizing the out-of-the-box native integrations that CyberArk now has with Red Hat's Ansible Tower as of version 3.5.1. I'm actually rolling with in my environment 3.6.2, but it's okay. As long as you have 3.5.1, at least you should be good to go from here. Uh, we'll also be looking at it from uh, CyberArk's Conjure perspective as well, and we'll be using Conjure Enterprise in order to also grab secrets from there. The whole setup will be really, really cool. I'll show you how to create those credential types in the credential store in Ansible Tower, utilizing Red Hat's new introduction of their ability to integrate with secrets management systems using secret lookups in the credential types section of Ansible Tower. We'll create those secret lookups. We'll create some actual credentials, uh, which will be our AWS access key that's available in both my PaaS solution as well as my Conjure Enterprise solution. And we'll be pulling those back for different uh, jobs that I have set up. We have one job set up for provisioning EC2 instances in AWS and a second job set up for deprovisioning. We'll be grabbing from two different sources for both of those. Sit tight relax, and let's go ahead and start taking a look at what we're dealing with here today. So what you should see on your screen here, transitioning, is my Password Vault web access login page. We're going to approach it from the central credential provider perspective first. I'm gonna tell you how I've got everything set up, walk you through how I set it up, and then we'll switch over to Ansible Tower and run a quick provisioning test on that. Now, if you remember from before, I explained a lot about how to deal with application identity and how to permission it onto safes. We're gonna cut out a lot of that meat and potatoes from this video, but I'm still going to review some of the more important points when it comes to configuring this uh, integration for you here today. So as you can see, I'm ready to go ahead and log in to my password vault. So I'm gonna click sign in since my credentials are already there and sign in as an LDAP user. And once our accounts view loads up, you'll notice that I have some favorites that I default to. That's fine if you don't, it doesn't really matter at this point. What we're more concerned about are two different things. First and foremost is our Ansible AWS access key in the enterprise password vault. It needs to be there for us to retrieve in the first place. And so as you can see, one of my favorite accounts in my accounts view is actually my Ansible AWS user is the name of the username in AWS IAM in my lab. If we take a look at this, we'll see that uh, the last day it was uh, it was verified 20 days ago, it was changed 20 days ago, we should be good. We're within my specific labs compliance of 90 days. Uh, so we're good to go from that perspective. It's onboarded into our safe D AWS access keys. So let's take a look at the safe's permissions to make sure we're ready to go for fetching this from our central credential retriever, our central credential provider. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead in the left sidebar here and I'm gonna choose applications. You can expand it out if you want some more options. I already know what I want, so I like to keep it nice and keep my real estate good on my uh, Password Vault web access UI screen in the accounts view. But I'm gonna select applications from the left sidebar here and that'll load up a search pane for me to start searching for application IDs. You know, typically enterprises will go with in excess of 500 application IDs very easily if they're really utilizing their application access manager providers sufficiently. Uh, so it's always good to just search and know what you're searching for. But in my case, in my lab, I don't have that many. So I can just do a blank search for everything, which I'll do by clicking the search button. It'll warn me that, hey, maybe I don't wanna do that, but I'm gonna go ahead and accept that because I know already what's in here. You may not, so you may wanna kind of limit and filter those searches a little bit more. But as you can see, I have a bunch of different application IDs here. My AIM web service is set up. We set that up in the last video. Uh, but I have a new application ID that I added specifically for Ansible Tower to use. It's called Ansible, as you could guess. 
Uh, so if we click on this, I'm just gonna make sure everything's set up okay. I've got, so I've set up certificate, uh, client certificate authentication for our central credential provider to add an additional layer of security when our Ansible tower is communicating with this uh, application ID. It needs to authenticate through IIS to make it to the web service um, uh, of the central credential provider by providing the proper client certificate for authentication on that end. And then even further, once it makes it to the actual application ID and we start to do our allowed machines check, which are these IP addresses here, uh, one of which is my Ansible tower, the other two are for other assets. Uh, the authentication here on the, on the authentication pane, I've added the certificate serial number of that client certificate that we're accepting to be authenticated through IIS. So that way we have an additional layer of authentication in place before we can actually utilize this application ID to retrieve any secrets. We have to verify the serial number of the certificate we gave for that authentication. So very, very, very secure here. Um, as long as all of this matches up, we should be good to go to start grabbing secrets from the safes that have the Ansible application ID as well as the AIM web service applied to it. So let's go into policies here and we're gonna take a look at my safe that we're going to be accessing the access key from. So I'm gonna to go to access control, which is where we keep all of our safes. And I'm gonna select the D AWS access key safe where as you can tell by my naming convention, because in automation, we want naming conventions, right guys? That's where my access keys for AWS live. So I'm gonna just take a look quickly at the members section and make sure everything is set up and good to go. We've got a bunch of different uh, app IDs here. I see our AIM web services here. Of course, our AIM web service does not require any permissions. It just needs to be present on the safe. And then my Ansible uh, application ID is here to be able to use retrieve and list all of the accounts that are in here. I kept it with default settings in this uh, in this instance, but it definitely didn't need to be able to view these safe members or view any audit activities. It doesn't care about that. All it cares about are accessing and, and being able to see the accounts within. So we're good to go from that perspective. Our application ID is, is, is uh, a safe member of the safe. We're gonna be grabbing the access keys from. Our access keys are compliant and, and, and verified. Uh, recently within the past 90 days. So from an EPV or a core PaaS perspective, if we think about the entire suite, we're good to go with the account being managed as well as being accessed from this solution. Now, what we need to do is turn to Ansible Tower and take a look how we integrate it with that. So here I have Ansible Tower already set up ready for me to log into. I'm gonna log in as admin at first to kind of show you around and so that I don't get limited with anything, but to actually run and provision these EC2 instances, we're gonna to switch to a member of a team that I've got created. I'm gonna explain that all to you now. So let me go ahead and sign in first as the admin so that we can start taking a look at what we've got here. So first and foremost, we're, 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 we have a dashboard here that gives us a, a great overlook, a, a overview of, of what I've got going on. I have one project, I have two inventories and 10 hosts in those two inventories. And as you can see, haven't really been failing a lot in my jobs. They've been mainly successful, which is good for me because that means that I don't have to really go in and fix anything if I was an admin of Tower. Now, as far as the templates are concerned, the credentials, things like that, you guys might not know what that is yet, but let's talk about the role-based access control that's in Tower first. In Tower, we're going to utilize the role-based access controls that are provided to be able to segregate duties among teams in our organization. And to give you an idea of this, I'm gonna access the access section as an administrator to show you what I'm talking about. Under organizations, I have two different organizations. I didn't delete the original test org that gets uh, populated by default when you install Ansible Tower for the first time. I just went ahead and created an additional one called CyberArk. Everything that I do in Ansible Tower will get associated with this CyberArk organization so that I can go ahead and, and divvy out the segregation of duties, the different role-based access controls that I need among the teams that I have in here. 
So this organization is just a way of associating with a greater group, uh, your different job templates, your credentials, projects, your inventory, all of your resources that you see here in the left-hand sidebar are going to all be associated with my organization of CyberArk. You may have a, an organization for just your enterprise as an entire whole, or it may be divvied out into multiple organizations based on departments or teams or however you have that uh, separated. However, in my instance, since I'm just running this in a lab that's very small, I'm able to just do a CyberArk organization. From there, I created two teams. And these teams are going to be an additional layer of role-based access control within the greater organization group. So if we imagine the greater organization, and then we take it a little bit smaller and we've got our two different teams, I've created two in the CyberArk organization. We've got a Conjure team, which, are, are, which holds all of the members of the Conjure InfoSec team within CyberArk, my organization as well as a PaaS team. So this is how we're going to be segregating the duties between who has access to what type of credentials in Ansible Towers credentials here. Our Conjure team will only be able to access credentials that can be used against Conjure to fetch the secret. And furthermore, they'll only be able to run job templates or jobs that are associated with those same secrets that come from the Conjure team's Conjure instance. Separate from that, I've created a PaaS team. This is going to be utilizing the central credential provider in order to grab its secrets just in time and use them in the templates that it can use those secrets with. Uh, it will only be able to see credentials in Ansible Towers credential store that are associated with the CP, CCP as well. Uh, so we'll be able to bounce between two different users in order to get those two different views. So I'm trying to stage for you how you would do this in an enterprise setting by extending Ansible Towers RBAC into its solution while utilizing our RBAC within our platform to then be able to segregate the secrets uh, between the different duties by utilizing safes or by utilizing different host IDs with Conjure itself. As far as users are concerned, I happen to roll with South Park fourth graders uh, from the show South Park on, on Comedy Central. For my lab environments, it's just fun to do and, and I love the show. Uh, so we've got Butters Stotch, who is going to be on the Conjure team. He happens to enjoy DevOps a little bit. You know, he's always on edge, so it seems like a good fit for him. Kyle Broflovsky will be on our PaaS team. He's a member of that team. He will be dealing with the central credential provider. He's a little bit, you know, more of a safe guy, doesn't really want to get into the agile methodology, just likes to, you know, lay back and kind of just deal with the human access a little bit. But he's been forced to look into the central credential provider from an automation perspective. So, We'll, we'll, we'll deal with him on that. Kenny now is my auditor because, you know, everybody wants to kill Kenny. Uh, and then finally we have our admin, which is me, and I am logged in as admin right now. So those are the four users that we have in here right now. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take a look at the credentials that we have set up. So when I click on the credentials, I get, I, I'm an admin, so I get to see every credential that's in here right now. When we move over to Kyle and we move over to Butters, We'll only be able to see what they have access to, but as a system administrator, I get access to everything, except for the ability to view the secrets once they've been set in Ansible Tower, and I'll show you that here in a sec. So we're gonna be working with the central credential provider first, so I'm gonna focus on that. The AWS uh, PaaS Lab CCP is what I named the credential that is going to be looking up the secret in our central credential provider. If I select this, you'll notice it's already filled out with stuff, uh, but I can create a new one if I wanted to using a separate application ID even by clicking on and creating a new credential, giving it a name like ASDF. That's a great name, isn't it guys? Uh, giving it a description or not adding it to our organization of CyberArk so that I can start to apply permissions and role-based access control to it, and then selecting a credential type. Now, we have two new secret lookups as of 
Ansible Tower 351 that it's available out of the box, and here they are. The CyberArk AIM Central Credential Provider Lookup is for looking up and retrieving secrets from the Central Credential Provider. The CyberArk Conjure Secret Lookup is for retrieving uh, and returning secrets from within CyberArk Conjure. Whether that's the open source solution or enterprise, doesn't matter to us, same deal. Now you may notice the CyberArk PaaS REST API credential type here. Uh, this is a custom one that I created, and I'll show you where you can grab that in case you have a need for it in the future uh, as we start to look at the different playbooks we're gonna be running today. But for today, we're gonna focus on these two here uh, for setting up our different lookups. And you can think of a secret lookup kind of like a connection broker, as it would be called in some other solutions and platforms. It's just going to hold the information that Ansible Tower needs to access in order to make a connection over an API to our solutions. It's a really cool, really cool solution. Uh, so we could select the central credential provider lookup here, and it'll let us kind of fill out some additional information. We'll need to give the URL to the central credential provider's web service. Uh, so this would be um, to wherever that web service lives, the, uh, the, the, the URL. The application ID will end up getting hidden after I add it in. And this is going to be the identity that you just saw from our Password Vault web access. I'm using Ansible. So if I were to create a new one, I would type in Ansible here for my application ID. And so that way, when it goes to make a request to the provider for the secret, it's able to give its identification. And then finally, you'll see we have a client key uh, section for a private key, as well as a client certificate section for a client certificate in order to be able to handle client certificate authentication if it's set up with the central credential provider. But as you'll notice, they're not required. They don't have the red asterisks. So if you don't have client certificate authentication set up, it's okay for testing. I do would recommend you set it up for any production tasks that you're going to be running. So for testing in dev or in QA or, or wherever um, you know you, your environment is, it's okay to go with just the URL and the application ID, but definitely from a production perspective, you wanna introduce a client certificate into that. We're not gonna be going over how to set that up in this video, but if it's something that you guys like, go ahead down in the comments and comment that you'd like to see how to do client certificate authentication, and I'll definitely uh, look into creating a video for that soon. So this is the, the initial setup. I've already obviously gone ahead and taken care of that for you. You saw it before. Uh, so if we dive in and take a look at the secret lookup once it's done, you'll see that the application ID, the client key, and the client certificate are all encrypted. I'm a system administrator and it shows encrypted to me. I can't click it and get it to show. I can replace it, but that's going to wipe out what's already set there. And so I'll have to reset my client certificate authentication or find the key and the certificate and update everything or just change it outright. And there's no way that I can show it. I don't know if you can hear, but I'm clicking show here. Nothing's happening. So that's not gonna work, but Everything is set in here. I can't view it. You can't view it. Kyle can't view it. Butters can't view it. Kenny can't view anything but reads. He's an auditor, so. Um, so that's that. It's in here, it's secure, it's encrypted. We're good. Even if, let's say, hypothetically, even if it was somehow brought out in plain text and we were able to retrieve it, and take it to our own workstation and try to make an access attempt to retrieve secrets using this information. At the end of the day, the application ID itself, whoops, let me find it, there we go. The application ID itself, if you remember for Ansible, has allowed machines with IP addresses here. Unless you're an allowed machine, IP address, subnet, FQDN, DNS name, what have you, you're not getting through. There's multiple levels of authentication that are required before you can access a secret that an application ID has access to see. So very, very cool, very secure solution here. All right. So we've got a quick look at how we set up the secret lookup, but that's not getting us any secrets. How do we do that? Well, let's, let's take a look at that real quick. If we go back to the credentials section, we've created 
machine credentials, Amazon Web Services credentials, those normal credentials that you're used to creating in, in Ansible Tower. You can create any type of credential type. Even my CyberArk REST API user comes from it, the Enterprise Password Vault, from my core PaaS lab that's in AWS. So let's, let's see how that works out. Actually, I don't even need to create a new credential for this. We'll just access the CCP's credential here. It's an Amazon Web Services credential. So it's out of the box. Uh, type that you can add on to a job template for being able to utilize AWS's CLI or API in order to, you know, whatever, provision EC2 instances, make changes to VPCs, anything, you know, that you're able to do through the AWS CLI. And as we look at the details here of this credential, you might notice something a little different. Not everything is saying encrypted or hidden or or there. Uh, there's actually a what looks to be a badge of some kind for the secret key. That's the secret sauce. At the end of the day, if I want to pull in something from the central credential provider, such as my secret key, all I have to do is click these little magnifying glasses you see everywhere here, and it'll ask me, hey, what input source do you want to pull this information from? Well, I've got two choices. I've set up two, right? We saw it. We've got the CCP or Conjure. In this instance, I chose the CCP. So the CCP will be communicated with in order to retrieve securely this password. The metadata doesn't hold anything. Oh, wait, there it is. Yeah, the metadata did load. Sorry. It's the object query that we're used to sending as URL parameters when we're requesting a secret from the central credential provider. The safe, we already looked at that safe. We know that's the proper safe. The object name of the Ansible AWS user. And that's all I need to give. If I had a reason that was required in order for me to retrieve this, I could provide a reason. But it's not necessary in my lab. I don't require it. And we do have a pretty cool test button here that we can click to test and you can see the test passed. It's not giving me the actual value back, but it was able to get a 200 okay status code from uh, the request that was sent to where I set up the secret lookup to look to for the central credential provider. So with all of this, we should be good to go to provision using Kyle. So I'm gonna go ahead and log out now as admin I'm gonna log in as Kyle, sign in. Now Kyle will only be able to see what he's allowed to see. I've allowed him to read our project. I allowed him to read our AWS inventory that's dynamic so he can see those 10 hosts, but he can't do anything other than read. His permissions are legit, just read. What he can see also is from a credentials perspective, he can see the CCP, and the REST API user. So he only can see those things that are, make sense to him on the PaaS team. He is a member of the PaaS team. Now, if we take a look at templates, there's a lot more templates than this that we'll see when we're an administrator again in a minute, but he only sees the ability to provision. The central credential provider in my lab is only allowed to be used to provision EC2 instances. So that's the PaaS team's job. Provision these instances and then we'll log in as butters to deprovision them using the same access key only fetched from Conjure this time. So if we go ahead and we launch off what, rel8, we want to start, start this job, we can click the little rocket and this will go off to the races. Um, we can come over here to templates again, and we can click the little rocket for Ubuntu, and then that'll go off. And you can see here that we're using the credential Ansible AWS user from CCP. So this is how we know it's all coming from the CCP. And this job will run through once it updates the inventory and everything. But at the end of the day, it's going to start this instance changed. That's what we want to see. If we come into my instances and we refresh, there's our two pending EC2 instances starting up right now for Rel8, for Ubuntu. Those are the two I just clicked. So we're gonna keep those booting up. Um, we've been able to access over the central credential provider, the AWS access key, using the integration with Ansible Tower in order to fetch it just in time. What, what does that mean? 
That means I can rotate that. That's huge. I can rotate my AWS access key as often as I want because I'm grabbing it just in time to do these actions. I'm not gonna break anything in Ansible. I'm not gonna break anything in my automation if I'm rotating aggressively. So I could have a compliance of 24 hours for my AWS access keys for rotation. As long as I'm utilizing the integration with CyberArk, I don't have to worry about ever managing that in the Ansible Tower side of things. I'm gonna be grabbing that just in time. So that's pretty cool. Let's take a look at the Ansible Tower playbooks real quick while we wait for everything to spin up and then we'll move on to Conjure. The Ansible Tower playbooks that I use in my demo, as well as in other demos, is available on GitHub uh, at infamousjog forward slash ansible dash tower dash playbooks. And if you know me at all, you've probably seen my repositories list on GitHub, um, and you should be able to browse there, just type in Ansible and see everything that I have repository-wise uh, regarding Ansible. If you're an Ansible core, Ansible project, Ansible engine user, where you're using the CLI instead of the user interface and the RBAC that Tower provides, I do have playbooks for that as well. So definitely search for Ansible. We're gonna focus on this though. I do run Ansible Lint using GitHub Actions on all of my playbooks, and you can see down here at the bottom that it is passing. So we're good to go from a linting perspective. These playbooks should run in Ansible Tower. Whether they successfully complete or they fail is a different story, right? Come on, guys. So as far as provisioning is concerned, I just used the EC2 module here in order to spin up those instances. With the EC2 module, I'm just providing uh, the, the Amazon Web Services credential uh, to the job template, and then it's able to read the environment variables those are injected as uh, in order to be able to connect and then set all of this up for me. So very simple provisioning. If you guys want to learn how to provision different instances using the EC2 module, this is a good example to do it. For deprovisioning, it's the same thing using the same module. The only difference is that I get every instance based on the tag that I have set on it. So I do set a tag so I can kind of realize what is you know, a, a provisioned Ansible EC2 instance and what's not so that I can then go ahead and terminate all of them when I'm done testing or demoing or whatever it is that I'm doing that day. And then finally also in here, I have the credential type for the CyberArk PaaS REST API. The injector YAML, the input YAML is here for you to use and it'll get included as uh, these environment variables here, CyberArk API password, API URL, and API username. Those will be injected into your playbooks uh, through the job template uh, if you utilize this credential type so that you can use it with our PaaS collection as well as any other roles that are available that utilize the R PaaS REST API in order to communicate back to our solution. So again, go check this out. It's out there on GitHub, it's public, it's ready to go, it's good for you, it's good for me, it's good for all of us. I'm gonna close it out now. So that's that's the central credential provider, guys. We're ready to turn to Conjure now. I can't even believe that uh, it's going this smooth and it's going this easy and I haven't had to make an edit yet to the video. This is awesome. So let me go ahead, I'm gonna close out of the PVWA too. We've proved our point here. Ah, CyberArk Conjure. Now this, remember, works with both Conjure Enterprise as well as Conjure Open Source. So whether you're using one or the other, the only difference you're gonna have is that I get a UI because I'm using Conjure Enterprise and if you're using Conjure Open Source, you don't. You get our command line interface, you get our API, which is now documented in Postman. Um, but for today, we're going to be using Conjure. So I'm gonna show you how I kind of set it up and we'll, we'll take a look at how this goes. So I'm gonna go ahead and log in as admin here. Oh wait, actually I changed admin's password, so that's good Good on my part, but I, I don't know it anymore. Actually, I don't even know mine. Let me uh, go ahead and, and grab that real quick from the password vault where I stored it. So I'm gonna have to log, oh wait, I'm still logged in here. It logged me into the old UI, very cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and select me and I'm gonna copy that down. Oh no. All right, please hold while I do this and I will cut this out. All right, so I just copied the password to my clipboard in a way that you couldn't see. 
uh, because I didn't feel like installing the um, extension that I needed in order to copy it to a clipboard in Firefox. Uh, so I should be good to log in with Joe now. Let's go ahead and do that. And as you can see here uh, from my my dashboard overview of, of what I have here. I've got 26 secrets, I've got a service, I got three hosts, I got three users, I got groups, blah, blah, blah. We've got a lot going on here. Uh, but what we wanna take a look at is our host section first. And under hosts, I do have a few hosts, but we're gonna be taking a look at our EC2 deploy Ansible Tower host ID. Uh, you can tell that this works with Ansible by the badge in the integration section of this. And when we take a look, uh, we can see that it all flows down to admin, which is not important here. Uh, but what the privileges it has is the host role, Ansible Tower, which Ansible Tower is going to run as, and that secret lookup has the ability to execute as well as read these secret values, the access key ID, as well as the access key secret. These secrets can be found over here in the secrets section. And both of these were all configured, the host as well as the two secret variables were configured through a policy. I'm not gonna be going over the policy today. However, if you would like to learn more about this policy, uh, I have documentation that should be online here shortly on docs.conjure.org as well as docs.cyberarc.com. Uh, that will lay out all of the policy definitions that you need in order to accomplish this. But at the end of the day, our secret lookup will be utilizing this host here. Uh, it will be accessing these secrets as long as we authenticate properly from Ansible Tower uh, and then deprovisioning our EC2 instances that we just created. So let's go to these secrets. We'll pull up uh, the access key ID and we'll keep that up so that we can take a look at it here in a minute. Less than a minute ago, this was me checking that I can read it. That's what we call just being able to view that the secret exists is a read action. To execute, that would be me viewing or editing the secret data. Now you saw this when I was uh, looking at the secret lookup for the central credential provider, so I don't mind showing it to you again. You still don't know my secret key, so have fun trying to figure that out. Uh, but you can see now, if we scroll down to the audit section um, and refresh, it should show that I executed, and I did. Yeah, I fetched it here, and then checked if I could read again when I just refreshed, and it was successful. So our audit events are happening. I'm gonna keep this up while we look at everything else. Um, back over here, I'm gonna go ahead and log out for a sec, and I'm gonna log back in as admin for Ansible Tower. And if we take a look at the credentials section again, we're gonna focus on the Conjure side of the house today. Uh, I do have the Conjure secret lookup already configured here. And if we take a look in there at what we can configure, you'll see that it has a couple different fields in the type details than the central credential provider does. We do have to provide the URL for the, where the Conjure service lives, which I've gone ahead and done here. Uh, but we also have to provide the API key that is granted to our host when we create our host via Conjure policy. It will come back as a response when you load the policy for the first time. So be sure that you save it. Otherwise you'll have to rotate your API key for the host as an administrator in order to reclaim a new API key. You cannot display the same API, API key uh, more than once. It's just during that initial policy load, the response will include the API key. Make sure you save it and put it somewhere safe. Um, our account is the account when we installed and deployed Conjure, uh, what I wanted to name the account that was created for it. I named it CyberArk Demo. Here we have EC2 Deploy Ansible Tower, but when it comes to host identities, we have to prefix it with host forward slash, which I've gone ahead and done here. And then finally, because I'm using Conjure Enterprise, I have to provide the public key certificate for that Conjure Enterprise solution, which I've gone ahead and done here. If you're using open source, you will not need to uh, provide this unless you have set up a TLS or SSL for some reason, then you will need to provide the certificate. As you can see, it is not required in case you do have an open source situation where you don't need to provide any public key certificate. You can go ahead and do that. 
And the cool thing about these secret lookups too, the central credential provider as well as this one, is it also has its own test button. So we can test the connection, make sure the credentials are correct uh, for the lookup and that we were able to make a connection. We could provide a secret identifier. Let's take the secret identifier for this one here, EC2 deploy access key ID. We'll copy and paste that over here. And then we can select a secret version because we save all versions of secrets in our Conjure solution. Uh, by not giving a secret version, we'll just get the latest, which is fine with me. And it should return test passed, which it did. So it was able to connect as well as access that secret variable that I just went and copied the name from. So everything seems to be working from my perspective. Let's go ahead and set up the credential now. So here we have a credential type of Amazon Web Services, and now I've denoted it for coming from Conjure. Instead of having the access key ID hard-coded here, I went ahead and I'm, I'm grabbing that from Conjure as well. I can do two different fetches with Conjure, uh, one for the access key, one for the secret key. And just like with the central credential provider, we click the magnifying glass to set the input source. And the input source in this instance is going to be Conjure. And the metadata that you saw before is going to be this, come on, is going to be the same. Uh, the secret identifier here, no version for the secret so that it's, that it's latest. And we can test this again. And we know it's going to pass. It already passed before when we tested this out. So we should be good to go. Let's take a look at all of the templates that I have, though. So from my templates perspective, this is everything that I have. I have my three provisions, I have my three D provisions, plus one to D provision all of my EC2 instances if I just have a, a great day of testing and, and sandboxing and I just happen to deploy like, you know, a bunch of these instances I lost track, I can just come here and deprovision all of them and in one failed uh, job launch and, and be done with it. Uh, and I also have a workflow here that is, is very cool. This workflow, if I show you the configuration of it, it does my entire demo in just like one workflow. And if we visualize this workflow, when I start the workflow template, it's going to launch AWS provision tasks for Ubuntu, CentOS, and RHEL EC2 instances. Once these all complete and are running in my AWS lab, then we'll kick off using Conjure to grab the secret, the deprovision tasks for each of them. So it's a cool way of me being able to quickly show you a demonstration that, hey, this works, I'm able to do this. Let's move on with life and talk about the real cool stuff, uh, like how can we integrate this with what you've got going on and how we can do it in a secure fashion. If you haven't played with workflow templates, they're definitely really, really cool uh, for you to be able to combine all your different job templates and, and create a very cool uh, pipeline of, of configuration. However, I'm not going to kick those off. Uh, I'm going to switch over now to Butters, and we're going to take a look from Butters' perspective as to what he can see. Uh, just a note as I do that, I did provision Butters to have singular access during testing to one specific CCP uh, credential. So. Don't hate me for doing that. It's obviously not a best practice, but you'll see from the permissions section that it was a one-off and not part of a group. So as far as his credentials are concerned, like I said, only Conjure. I did grant him access to the REST API user just in case he needed to utilize it. This is the secret I was talking about. If we look at the permissions of the CCP user, he was granted singular access. So this is uh, what? what would we call that, like privilege creep or something like that? Definitely not least privileges. He doesn't need access to this. So I've already violated my own security policy I made up in my head uh, as I started doing this video. So we're all human, you know, mistakes happen. And, you know, that's why we want to make sure that we're monitoring and auditing our automation to make sure that things like this doesn't happen. I'm going to have to go fire Kenny or kill him, whichever comes first uh, for missing that Butters had access to the CC or yeah, to this uh, CCP credential outside of a team. Um, but you know what? Uh, I'm going to let Kenny pass on this for now so that we can complete this video. As far as Kyle's concerned, though, you can see that he does have the ability to use it, and it does denote that he has that ability from the PaaS team. So that's what we want to see from Butters, too, on other credentials. 
for example, this Conjure one, we should see Butters having access to it from a team. I hope so. I didn't check before. Yep, there we go. So he's able to use this through the Conjure team, which is how it should be. So he has access to these secrets. He only has access to the 3D provisioning job templates. So let's see, what do we have running here? We have Ubuntu and RHEL. So we're gonna kick off those deep provisioning tasks here and it should pull from Conjure and then we can audit the events in Conjure as well. So let's deprovision provision RHEL. And that'll kick off. Well, I don't think we need to wait very long for this. So there you go, that's, that's running. And then we'll do Ubuntu. And then since Ubuntu is last, we'll wait for that one to end and we'll go take a look at the EC2 instances in my lab. So it's going to always uh, beforehand update my inventory, update uh, the project. The project is basically where my playbooks live in, in GitHub. It's going to refresh and make sure there were no changes made. It'll refresh the lab inventory to make sure that it knows all the hosts that are out there and then it'll kick off the job. There we go. So it's gonna go ahead and get all of the EC2 instances and it found one, so it's gonna go ahead and start shutting it down. If I refresh here, we should see that they are both, oh, looks like the rel already terminated, that was quick. So Ubuntu's shutting down now. Uh, I only show pending running and shutting down. Uh, so if it's terminated, you don't really get to see it. I could add it in here, but it'll get dirty because I've been testing this all day. Now from the Conjure UI perspective, the last audit event we had was that I could read when I refreshed, you know, but I actually fetched the access key ID too. If we refresh now, we should see my host identity for Ansible Tower being able to fetch this. Let me go ahead and refresh. It'll say I read it, but then a minute ago we had a pool uh, from Ansible Tower's host, Ansible Tower's host. So we've got, yeah, we've definitely, we're working here. We've got the, the pools from everything. So we're good to go with the access key ID. The audit is in place. I know that this was from an EC2 deploy action uh, where it was accessing the access key ID. And all I have to do in order to create a, uh, a segregation of duties across teams that are utilizing Conjure is just to create a new credential type, right? Uh, a new credential using the type for the Conjure secret lookup and then I will provide the host ID that I create for that next team. So if it's, you know, team A, team B, team C, I can have three different host IDs all set up and then use the RBAC from Tower uh, and the, the, the team's idea in order to assign those teams to their specific lookup. So at the end of the day, they'll only have access to the secrets that they need in our solution. And this works the same way for the central credential provider and the application IDs that I showed you. So that's it, guys. I mean, that's it. That's how easy it is to get started integrating Ansible Tower from 3.5.1 on with both CyberArk products, Conjure Enterprise and Conjure Open Source, as well as our Application Access Manager's central credential provider. I hope that this video has taught you a lot. I would love to hear about it down in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to me as well as like this video so that we can get it moving around the CyberArk community and get more eyes on this. Let's spread the CyberArk love and I will talk to you guys soon in the next installment of Joe and Code. Thanks everyone.